What's up everyone, it's Prabhdeep with Ace Pants and today we're going to talk about valvulus. So basically valvulus is twisting of the GI tract on itself. Uh, it most commonly affects the sigmoid colon and the cecum. But it can, ha uh, it can happen with the stomach, the small bowel, uh, splenic flexure, and even the gallbladder, okay? But most commonly it affects the sigmoid colon and that's what we're going to focus on, sigmoid valvulus. So the epidemiology of these patients is m mainly uh, at the age of 70 and above. Obviously it can happen in the younger patients, but most commonly seen in 70 and above. It usually affects men more than females. And um, these patients are usually institutionalized, meaning they're in the nursing home and they have history of chronic constipation. Now let me explain to you the pathophysiology as to why this happens. And then epidemiology is gonna make sense by itself. Now, as we get older, especially 70 and above patients, uh, the colon becomes very redundant, especially the sigmoid colon, right? And it's not as tightly packed as it would be in a younger patient. And on top, on top of that, the chronic constipation puts a lot of stool load on the sigmoid colon. Now, think about it, right? You have the descending colon and then the sigmoid colon. And, you know, it's at the edge and the corner at, in the left lower quadrant. So all the stool load rests in the sigmoid colon and over time it elongates the sigmoid colon and dilates it, right? Because all the uh, stool is being pulled by the gravity and it's being held in the sigmoid colon. So because it's elongated, dilated, and now redundant because it moves a lot, it has a higher chance of twisting on itself, okay? And that's what sigmoid valvulus is. And that's why you see it in patients of 70 have chronic constipation, okay? And uh, now how do these patients present to us, right? They're gonna come in with abdominal distension, abdominal pain, uh, nausea, and obstipation, obviously, right? Now the vomiting happens a few days later, and it kind of makes sense, right? Because the obstruction is distal, uh, it's at the side of sigmoid colon. Now you have the whole descending colon, you have the transverse colon, and you have the ascending colon along with the small bell to store all that backflow that's not going through the sigmoid colon, right? So you have a lot of room to work with. Uh, and for that reason, the vomiting doesn't happen like one to two days later. And when it does happen, uh, the vomiting is mostly uh, fecalate, okay? Now that's different from a proximal obstruction, uh, if it happens in the proximal uh, small bowel, because that vomiting is gonna be more bilious than fecalate, and it's gonna happen more, uh, I'm sorry, it's gonna happen uh, a lot earlier in the presentation. So patient's gonna develop abdominal pain, soon after they're gonna have nausea and vomiting. Whereas with large bowel obstruction or like sigmoid valvulus or distal small bowel obstruction, the vomiting is gonna take time for it to develop, okay? And a lot of times it's gonna be fecal, especially with large bowel obstruction and sigmoid valvulus. Uh, so yeah, going back to symptomatology, they're gonna have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting will develop in one to two days, they're gonna have obstipation and abdominal distension. Now, how do we diagnose this? So you can get abdominal x-ray, um, but CAT scan is preferred. And the reason for that is uh, you wanna know if the patient has ischemia or not. Because think about it, the sigmoid colon is twisting on itself and it can cut off the circulation, okay? And if it does, it will develop into ischemia. And you can only see that on CAT scan, not on, on abdominal x-ray. Now, what are the findings of ischemia? So you give the patient IV contrast, okay? And if the contrast lights up the sigmoid colon wall, that means circulation is intact. If it doesn't, then obviously circulation is not intact. Uh, another few findings uh, that indicates ischemia is if there's thickening of the bell. Now think about it. If there's ischemia, there's gonna be inflammatory process initially. So that's gonna, um, on the CAT scan, it's gonna appear as thickening of the bell, right? Or uh, you might see air in the bell um, that's called pneumatosis, uh, or you might see the air escaping into the portal venous system uh, or the mesentery, uh, mesenteric arteries. So, though, and, and, and you might have fast stranding around the sigmoid colon where the um, ischemia is. If ischemia gets bad enough, it can result in perforation because remember, dead cells are more prone to breaking up versus healthy ones, right? So, um, yeah, keep in mind, uh, make sure you do CAT scan with IV contrast to rule out ischemia, okay? And before you give IV contrast, make sure, guys, you check their creatinine, okay? A lot of these patients are gonna come in AKI, acute, uh, acute kidney injury um, because they're gonna be dehydrated 
and they're elderly. Uh, even a little bit of dehydration is gonna bump up their creatinine. So make sure you keep that in mind and get BMP and rule out AKI. Or if they have CKD, you wanna see how bad their creatinine is and see if you can give the uh, contrast and maybe you know plan for HD afterwards. But just keep that in mind, BMP, look at creatinine. Do not give IV contrast without having a baseline creatinine, okay? Um, Another thing to look out for is perforation, right? Like we spoke about with ischemia, um, because you think about it, if the distension is bad enough and it keeps on stretching the bowel, it can, you know, uh, tear up and lead to perforation. So those two things you have to keep in mind when you're looking at volvulus because it can drastically uh, change your management. Now that's diagnosis. Let's move on to how to manage these patients. So if patient has just sigmoid volvulus and nothing else, no ischemia, no perforation. The first line of treatment is uh, sigmoidoscopy, basically decompressing them endoscopically, right? Uh, if they're successful, great. If they're not, then the patient has earned a trip to the OR urgently, okay? Now, if in addition to sigmoid volvulus, uh, you have ischemia uh, or perforation or both, uh, you need to take the patient to the uh, to the operating room emergently. All right, um, to keep that in mind. Now, what does the operative uh, operative management really um, makes up of? So basically, we know the problem here is an elongated, dilated, redundant sigmoid colon. So you take it out, you do a sigmoidectomy, and after that, you can majority of time you're going to give them a colostomy but you can do primary anastomosis but majority of time it's not done okay these are older patients with a lot of comorbidities um, and if you do primary anastomosis there's a high chance they might develop a leak and you know that can have some so catastrophic um, cause ca catastrophic complications uh, so you want to avoid that. So you want to just stick with a colostomy and down the line, if you want to reverse it, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay. Uh, now going back, if the patient does get, um, decompressed by a sigmoidoscopy, that doesn't mean that they don't go to the OR. Okay. They will eventually have to go to the OR, get that sigmoid colon taken out, but it's just not done urgently. Okay. Uh, if you know, you're successfully able to decompress them, uh, or detorse them, uh, endoscopically, then you can call the medicine team. Uh, make sure the patient is, you know, medically stable and medically optimized to go to the OR because you got to make sure these patients can handle the stress of the surgery. Uh, their bodies are capable of doing that. Obviously, in urgent situations, you're not going to call the medicine team for a medical clearance, but if they're detoursed, then it buys you more time. But on that admission, you try to, you know, uh, do the sigmoidectomy and, and, you know, give them a, a colostomy possibly, okay? Um, that's about it. I hope you guys learned something new today. Uh, and if you did, like and share this video with your friends and colleagues. I would greatly appreciate it. And um, that's it for this video. Stay safe, everyone. Stay tuned. I'll be back very soon. Till then, take care.